Hi, Daniel. Hi, Jamaka. Good, good, good afternoon.
HMO. HMO. Hi, Jumake. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good afternoon, Daniel. Good afternoon, Hakim. How's everybody? Yeah, we're good on this side. Yeah. Thank God. Good afternoon, testing one, two, testing. Can I please ask if my panelists can hear me? Testing one, two, testing. Uh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much for joining in uh, right on the dot of three. We will start in another two minutes, uh, just trying to get a critical mass of attendees uh, so that we can make the best of the workshop. Thank you very much for joining. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to 
uh, this digital workshop. I uh, first have to say a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you're logging in from. Uh, just checking that my microphone quality is fine and that everyone uh, can hear me. My name is Soji Akinyele, uh, and it's a delight to welcome you again to this digital workshop um, organized by the Covenant Nation, and in particular, the People in Government Community Group of the Covenant Nation. Uh, the People in Government Group is a network of public servants um, across all levels of government, in ministries, departments, and agencies uh, that have basically created a safe haven uh, to fellowship, experience, uh, collaborate, teach each other, and help one another uh, in such a way that reassures them that they are not alone you know, in this government business. Uh, we like to think of it as the biblical 7,000 others who are not uh, about to bow. So the aim really is to build a godly society of public servants uh, who will change the culture and um, adjust you know, the negative perception uh, in the public service, you know, one person at a time. And today, uh, we will be addressing one of those negative perceptions uh, as we look onto the topic, improving uh, public sector productivity, a call to action. The reason for this topic is because, you know, there is the perception out there that uh, the public service is probably not uh, is meeting its standard in terms of what it should be doing. And so uh, performing at subpar. Uh, but today we will interrogate some of those challenges. We will assess the current level you know, of, of uh, public sector pro productivity. We will look at some of the multi-dimensional perspectives uh, coming from our distinguished panelists who I'll be introducing shortly. And since we have called it a call to action, we will take and extract some actionable insights that we can implement individually as public sector workers and also you know, in our teams, in our departments, agencies, in order to build our nation. Uh, to do justice to this, I have four, you know, very expert speakers uh, who have been described, and I just want to read out, uh, there was a gentleman who described them in a very sincere way, and uh, I'd like to read out what he said. He described them as young um, public sector influencers uh, who are able to take decisions and cultivate the culture in the public service. So those were his words. Young public sector influencers who are able to take decisions in the public service and cultivate uh, the culture. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to welcome my distinguished panelists and I'll be introducing them shortly. But more importantly, I'd like to thank uh, So without further ado, I'd like to introduce in no particular order uh, my panelists, uh, Dr. Jumoke Oduwale is the special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. Until her appointment in August 2019, she was president on industry trade and investment in the office of the vice president from October 2015 to May 2019. She is the secretary to the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, PEBEC, chaired by the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, SANGCON, and coordinates the activities of its secretariat with a vision to make Nigeria a progressively easier place to do business. Among other notable achievements, her team is responsible for Nigeria moving up an unprecedented 39 places uh, in World Bank's flagship doing business report in three years and has been named twice in these three years among the top 10 most improved economies. Prior to 2015, Dr. Oduwale was a senior lecturer in international trade law at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, and an elected member of the university's Senate after a career in the Nigerian banking sector. Dr. Oduwale holds an LLM degree from Cambridge University, England, as well as a second master's and a doctorate degree in international trade and development from Stanford Law School, USA. And also to add that Dr. Duwale was my former boss. Uh, so Dr. Duwale, you're welcome again. And it's a pleasure to, to see you. Thank you, Sergi. You. You're welcome. Next is Mr. Hakim Olayinka Muriokwala, 
Mr. Murokonla was sworn in as the 21st head of service in Lagos State by His Excellency, the governor of Lagos State, Mr. Akiomi Ambode, then governor, uh, on the 31st of December, 2018, a position that he still occupies till date. Prior to this appointment, Mr. Murio Kuala has served as the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth and Social Development between 2015 and 2018, Permanent Secretary Lands Bureau from 2011 to 2015, Executive Secretary Land Use and Allocation Committee from 2005 to 2011, Personal Assistant to then Governor of Lagos State, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, as well as Company Secretary Ibile Holdings, which is the investment company of Lagos State Government. Uh, notable achievements in these roles include the amendment of the child rights law, the child protection policy of Lagos State, and the overall transformation of the processes of the Ministry of uh, Youth and Social Development when he was permanent secretary, as well as the initiation of the issuance of electronic certificates of occupancy, that's EC of O, the electronic data management system, and the consistent 30-day processing of consent applications which pushed Lagos State government's position in the World Bank ranking of the Ease of Doing Business Index. Mr. Murio Kola holds a master's degree in international business law from Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London, England, as well as a bachelor's degree in law from the Lagos State University, Ojo, Lagos. He is a member of both the Nigerian Bar Association and the International Bar Association. Mr. Murio Kola, you're welcome to this workshop and thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you very much, thank you. Mrs. Alero Aida Otobo is a transformation strategist with an invaluable understanding of sector-wide reforms across Africa. Uh, she has served as a senior advisor and transformation task leader to a former Minister of Education in Nigeria in 2006-2007 after over 10 years in the financial services industry. She was also for four years, uh, between 2008 to 2012, a lead specialist for education policy under the Education Sector Support Program for Nigeria, a program that was funded by the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, DFID. She's a graduate of Somerville, Somerville College, Oxford University, the Bartlett School of Architecture and Town Planning, University of London, and the London Business School. She is also the founder of Incubator Africa, a development agency established in 2012 that mobilizes and equips reformers to collaborate and actively participate in strategic reform activities. Alero is a British Chivlin Scholar and the recipient of the British High Commission's Award of Outstanding Performance in the year 2000. In, the year 2000. in 2007, she received an Excellence Award in National Development and Reformation Strategy from the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, NESG. She is the author of the book, Reformers Arise, which, uh, which has the sole objective of activating a people of dignity and integrity, both reformers and what she calls reform entrepreneurs, whose vision is to change the African narrative. Her mission going into 2021 is to build a community of reformers that will step out of their comfort zones and take responsibility for their nations. Mrs. Alera Aida Otobo, uh, thank you for joining us, you're welcome. Uh, last, of course, and definitely not the least, uh, Mr. Daniel Ekwenobe currently serves as Special Advisor to the Governor of Edo State on Economic Matters, and in that role, he doubles as the Chairman of the Edo State Economic Management Team. Prior to this appointment, he served as Senior Special Assistant to the President of Nigeria on the implementation of the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, ERGP, as well as the Coordinator of the ERGP Power and Gas Lab. Daniel specializes in the design and implementation of public policy, corporate strategy, and planned change. He has led a number of organizational and sector-wide transformation projects, especially in the energy and maritime sectors. He was part of the initial team that set up and evolved the operational framework for the presidential delivery unit in the office of the vice president of Nigeria, which focused on the social intervention programs and the ERGP implementation unit in the Ministry of Budget and National Planning. Mr. Daniel Ekonobe, you're welcome to, to this digital workshop and thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and it's my honor to moderate this session. Uh, may I ask just for a few ground rules uh, that um, 
you please chat your comments, put your comments in the chat box, uh, use the Q&A box also for uh, any questions that you may have so that we can quickly filter. Uh, we will have in this session, uh, apart from the panelists speaking and, and attending to our questions, they will also be attending to your questions, uh, as many as we can take over the next 60 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn to my panelists um, as I wish them you know, a very exciting time discussing things that are you know, pertinent to the heart of any public sector worker in Nigeria. And so on that note, I want to start with Dr. Duwale uh, and you know, just coming from your profile, um, you know, you've experienced this across 50, over 50 ministries, departments and agencies interacting, uh, trying to galvanize some level of efficiency you know, uh, that will uh, translate into you know, an easier uh, business environment and enabling the business environment. Uh, so from all that experience so far, I think the, the first question to ask is, how would you assess uh, the current level of productivity in the public sector today? Dr. Dwali. Thank you for the question, Saji, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, I think that it's nuanced. I think that definitely the, the first thing that we can all agree is that the productivity can be a lot higher. But having said that, we do have pockets of excellence. And I'd like the private sector especially to know that because if I look at um, agencies like the immigration service, there's been a lot of reforms going on there. If I look at Nigerian um, Communications Commission, they've also been very productive in terms of the number of lines that they've been rolling out as regulators so, um, supporting um, the companies, the telcos. So, whether it's from a standpoint of efficiency, going through the processes, people issues, whether it's also from the infrastructure and capabilities that they have, whether it's from training, um, there are definitely pockets of excellence. Can there be a lot more? Yes. What we do at the Secretariat of the PEBEC, the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, is to work on people issues, processes, and of course the infrastructure challenges that enable productivity, efficiency, transparency. Um, so 54 MDAs right now, we also work with state governments. In fact, there's nobody on this, on this panel that I haven't worked with directly. Uh, HMO, Lagos State has been a champion of ease of doing business reforms and we can speak to, I won't take his thunder, but you already heard some in, in his profile. They've been a very strong partner in helping Nigeria move upwards. Uh, also, we partnered with Edo State, and indeed, before then, Daniel was, was our colleague at the federal level. Yes. And of course, Sister Lero has come to train the EBS team uh, at the beginning of 2018, I believe. So uh, transformation is a journey. What it takes is consistency. What it takes is consequence management and recognition of good work. And that's why I'd like to have a, a balanced and objective view on what productivity is and how it currently stands right now. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much for that. That's uh, uh, what you call an honest assessment. Productivity can be better. Uh, we have pockets of excellence um, and you've mentioned a, a number of them. I, I want to turn it over to the head of service uh, in Lagos State. And, you know, it's uh, without, you know, putting any pressure on you, I would like to state it this way, that you are the leader of the public service uh, depending on who you're listening to, you are the leader of the public service uh, in, the, um, in the fifth or seventh largest economy in Africa. Let's put it that way, <laughs> depending on you know, which statistics you're looking at. And so for me, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a very pertinent question that how would you uh, I, think I, I lost you briefly, Sergi, but I, I kind of follow the formats that you give me. Thank you for inviting this platform. And uh, I say hello to my fellow panelists and also to the listeners and viewers. Uh, well, productivity, as uh, Jumoke rightly said, is, is like an, a half cup of water. It's neither full nor empty. Um, it's a journey in itself, and it's measured by input and output. 
uh, it's easier to measure it in the private sector because you want to see a turnover that is financially induced. But in the public sector, it's uh, more difficult to measure productivity. But it's something that we know as public servants that we can always do a lot better for the electorate, for the Nigerians that we serve, especially the immigrations that I serve. I know that the civil service in Lagos uh, is constantly working on transformation, innovation, and creativity in service delivery to people. And even as a government, all we sit down to do every day is to see how processes can get better, is to target what we want to focus on. And in Lagos at the moment, we are focusing on six thematic areas that we intend targeting and focusing on while not neglecting other sectors of the economy. But those seem to be where we will be focusing our drive on for the next four years. As we can see, health seems to be ranking highest based on what we are seeing as the new normal in the world with the pandemic COVID around us. So I think that yes, productivity is in the public service as a major employer of labor, a major facilitator of business and provider for critical issues is something that we constantly work and strive to improve on. And Lagos State is not lagging behind. It's probably taking the lead in all sense of immunity among the states. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Head of Service. I, I think uh, Dr. Duala will check her numbers to make sure Lagos State is not lagging behind. <laughs> She can verify. <laughs> she can verify your assertions at that point. Uh, but, but very honest appraisal again. And um, you know, I, I'm hoping to get some contrarian views, uh, but no pressure on anyone. Uh, but uh, I'd like to hear from Mrs. Um, Aida Otobo. And uh, the reason why why I'm coming to you next is, uh, so you are what I would call an insider outsider. Uh, you've been in there and then you've come out, uh, and uh, but you're constantly interacting with the process, and you know, focusing now on transformation strategy. So really, you know, from your transform, wearing your transformation hat and your strategy hat, you know, what really is the current level of productivity in the public sector uh, Nigeria today? I'd like to wish everyone a very happy 60th um, anniversary, independence. And, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with all my um, the other panelists. I'm glad I came after Dr. Jumoke as well as um, Mr. Okwala, because I wish I had uh, as positive a response as, as both of you. Um, when you say half, is the glass half empty or half full? I'm going to be one that's going to be on the half empty side. So um, why? Because we observe and definitely there are pockets of excellence. There are pockets of, of, of high productivity. When I was in the civil service, when I worked with ministers, we definitely had that. But the truth is the common, the Nigerian on the street, um, the Nigerian in private sector, uh, the Nigeria in, in, in the school, the children in the schools, those who go to our health centers, if you're going to say, is our productivity high? I think they're going to disagree with, with, with what we've said so far. And so I'd just like to, if you'd like to permit me, just to bring some balance and why, so that we can explore how we're going to make the changes because Nigeria is poised for greatness. There's no doubt about it. And, we are, and, and, and certainly we are moving towards getting the glass completely full. But um, I, I like to sort of take it by, take my position by starting with this statement. And it's a statement that I, I, I like, and it's John Maxwell's Law of the Lid that talks about that um, often the reflection of someone's potential or leadership potential depends on how much, how much comp how competent they are and their leadership quotient. And unfortunately right now, our leadership quotient in the public sector is pretty low. And I'd like to start by telling a story and the story very quickly is 56 years ago, a man called Lee Kuan Yew, the former prime minister of Singapore came to Nigeria for the first time. And he came for the conference for the Commonwealth ministers. At the time he came, 
our gross domestic product was about the same as Singapore. It was actually higher. At that point in time, I think they had less than a billion um, dollars and we were higher at $4.2 billion. Fast forward 20 years, Singapore's gross domestic product is now $372 billion and Nigeria is $448 billion. It looks higher, but it's not in the sense that Singapore has 5.9 million people and we have 200 million people. So when you look at per capita, Singapore stands at about $65,000 per person and we are less than 2,500 per person. For me, looking at the data, looking at the evidence, productivity is not great. We have pockets where we've got to up our game. And there are ways, that I think as we progress, we're going to be able to answer that that question as to how to improve productivity. That's why we're here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, 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 Mrs. Otobo. Uh, so productivity is not great, um, I hear you, but again, you agree that there are pockets of excellence. And this is basically uh, the idea of asking this question around because it's the same question, is to balance, uh, you know, and bring the balance that you're talking about. Uh, so, so Mr. Konobe, uh, your, your, yours is, and it's interesting that Mrs. Otobo, you know, linked it to GDP and all of that, uh, you know, gross domestic product. So yours is a direct mandate as chair of the economic management team in a state, you know, to galvanize and bring people together, public servants, uh, in order to deliver on a mandate of economic growth or development, you know, uh, as the case may be. So my question to you will be, you know, how perhaps almost like how have you delivered on that mandate? But more importantly, uh, from perspective of Edo State, what is the productivity level like, you know, in the public sector there? What's the perception? What's your assessment? Well, um, like uh, I think the other um, you know, panelists have said, it, it's, it's evolving. Um, interestingly, uh, the major thrust, one major thrust of the governor's um, and next term is public sector reforms. In fact, just um, two days ago, we started an entire program for, you know, you know we built this um, John Oyegun um, civil service training center. So we we are scheduling, you know, lab style, all the, you know, MDAs, we're bringing them into one location um, to evolve a transformation framework, uh, which we are rolling out as we speak. Um, and that, you know, because we've been, we've been driving initiatives largely from the agencies and then special activities, but in order to deliver the kind of thing or the kind of results we hope to deliver, we have to strengthen the entire civil service um, uh, structure. Uh, I remember the opening, the opening day uh, when we were talking to the uh, civil servants, we said, no, we want to do the last four year like re report on all we've done. And I said to them that, you know, this typically takes us about three weeks to do. And they all laughed. And then I said to them, the good news is today we are going to do all that work by close of business today. And there were all kinds of doubts and Thomas is in the room. Um, but a number of the permanent secretaries walked up to me at the close of business when they had their reports, at least their draft reports ready. And they, were, they surprised themselves that they could actually produce that report in one day. And what did we do? We said in about six hours, we said, look, um, iteration, not perfection. Don't be afraid of coming out with things rough and dirty. So let's do if we have two iterations, three iterations, four iterations, the more iterations we have, the more perfect we will get by, by the final draft. And so that was the, the approach that we used. And by close of business, we had, we had that work done. And of course, they too were not doing some, some, other, some other piece of work. Um, and, and that goes to show that there is so much capacity within the public, the public sector. Sometimes just a bit of directing, a bit of redesign of our processes. And um, Soji, you saw what happened during the um, ERGP focus labs and how we saw um, public servants take things to the private sector and deliver results in, you know, in record time. So um, uh, I will say that for Edo State, uh, we are, we're gaining momentum. Um, we are excited to see the possibilities of what can happen as we work with the public sector in the next couple of, couple of weeks and couple of months. Interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Konobe. And you've actually answered two questions in one. So uh, you've left me in a hard place to think of a very good question to, uh, 
to put out there, but I, I have one for you uh, later on. Uh, but you basically just jumped into my next point, uh, you know, that I was going to uh, take on, take you on. Uh, so let me come back to uh, Mr. Mr. Murio Kwala. Um, so we've talked about, you know, assessing the level and we've said, look, uh, you know, there are rooms for improvement. We're constantly trying to improve. It's, uh, it's not, you know, it's half empty or it's half full. Uh, it's not so great. Uh, but I, I, there's a central theme that every panelist has, has made mention of here, the pockets of excellence. So I want to probe those pockets of excellence, basically, you know, uh, because, and perhaps we should define what we're talking about in terms of productivity. We're talking about the productivity of the public sector worker, you know, in, you know, in, in performing his or her duty. And then the collection of those things leading to, uh, you know, the delivery of public service, you know, uh, and the mandate of creating a living business environment and, and all the implementations of policy. Uh, so there are different dimensions to it, but this is you know, our own focus in the sense. So my question to you, Mr. Okonla, is what are, I, I want to call them productivity hacks, you know, just trying to use some modern terminology, that in the pockets of excellence that you have seen in the civil service as leader you know, of the civil service you know, in Lagos State, and I was corrected, um, um, very quickly about that. As the leader of civil service in Lagos State, what are the productivity hacks that you have seen? That look, when you look at somebody and say this person, you know, is a productive public worker or public sector worker, this pro person is a productive civil servant. What are those things that the person actually does, or that team actually does, you know, that 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 makes it work for them? So what works? I, I hope that's that's clear enough. Thank you very much, Sergi. I'll start first of all by trying to put it in perspective. Um, before we talk about productivity of an individual, we must first of all see to the terms and conditions and that is working on the environment in which he's working in and how we expect him or how to thrive. And that starts from a leadership perspective. And leadership is at every different level, from the senior level to the management level and to the junior level. So if it's a cleaner you see every day who is getting your office ready for you before 8 a.m. So, and is working beyond the 4 p.m. hours conscientiously and to the drivers who wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning to make sure that civil, service, civil servants get to their offices before 8. To the middle level uh, workers in lands bureau in the health sector to our frontline health workers that have stood the rigors of COVID, we can measure and see how they are performing based on the tools that they are given. So the government that we are running in Lagos State is one that try, tries as much as possible to motivate the workforce, making sure that there is, everything is technologically driven and trying to find empirical data to back whatever input or output ratios that we are putting out to the public. And so we wouldn't just use a rule of thumb or just um, social media. Although I, I agree with um, Mrs. Alero that yes, there is so much more room for improvement, but it also speaks to the distrust or the mistrust that the public have in engaging with the public service. and. Um, with time, definitely, we as government, and with transparency being the forefront of it, are trying to make everyone see that we're not just running a government, but we're running an open government that is trying to remove excessive bureaucracies that are attributed to civil service, reducing bottlenecks that have been put in place by the age-long tradition of the civil service, and trying to use more an efficient means of deployment of relevant technologies to our schools, to our health sector, to every particular area of civil service, so that every civil servant in Lagos State knows that he's accountable not just to himself or to his supervisors, but to the public to the public at large. So I think thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Head of Service. Uh, you know, I, I, I took out three points from, from, from your answer and because I was basically trying to listen for what works. Um, I heard you point to the leadership, 
uh, I heard you point to a very interesting, almost like a sense of conscience, you know, like a compassion, even for the uh, for the entry worker, even in the public system, in the public sector. You know, you talked about the drivers, you talked about the cleaners working late hours and just having a sense of conscience for them. But then you now leapfrogged, if you like, or you leapt into you know technology and using it as a means of efficiency and all of that. Uh, so I want to tie that to Dr. Duwale's question because. Um, and uh, forgive me, I because I've worked with doctor, I, I know a few things. And but so I want to ask: is that is that exactly what you are seeing, even at that you know uh, high level, if you like, at the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council? Particularly, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the Executive Order One of of the President, which you know speaks to transparency and efficiency in public service delivery. Uh, so, what exactly? What are the hacks there? Is it really the technology that that drives the, the productivity, or is there are there other things? Well, Soji, you know the answer because of your former job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> so, what it is is that this work is not, and I think my opening statement was that we definitely can have a lot more productivity, but that there are pockets of excellence because there's a preconception of negativity which is the distrust that is between the private sector and the public sector. And that is what HMO also alluded to. Now, with the executive order one, why do we need an executive order? Because we also wanted to make sure very quickly that transparency and efficiency is entrenched in the ease of doing business reforms. What we were trying to do uh, with the MDA is indeed what we were doing with them since 2016 by 2017, we saw that we needed an executive order and that executive order has six uh, pivots. Uh, please have a look on our website, but they all lead to making sure that collectives of ministries, departments and agencies stop working in silos. They have collective responsibility. So one of the uh, areas in the executive order speaks to entry and exit of people. All the agencies that work in the airport, immigration, NDLEA, customs, working together with FAN, uh, NCAA, they need to have service level agreements. They need to trust each other. They need to make sure that rather than protecting their turf, they are working together to deliver for the Nigerian people. So the people issues were key. The processes, sometimes there's just too much paper and there are just too many desks and it gives room to rent seeking opportunities, which is corruption, petty corruption. So the idea was to make sure that the processes are streamlined and transparent so that everybody knows what the processes are. It's on the website, the number of documents you need at a particular uh, point in time for a particular process, the amount of time it takes and who is responsible. We also tried to make sure that MDAs layer a lot of uh, automation on their processes. So that's why I can call out agencies like FIRS, uh, CAC, uh, immigration service, the customs service. When you drill down, these are huge agencies. So when people just wave a hand of, oh, nothing has happened, you should take time to drill down because people that have had success experiences down to forgetting your iPad at, at the airport and meeting it in Lagos three weeks later, most people will think how on earth is that possible? It's because there are now processes in place to make sure that uh, lost and stolen things are in the right place. They're not checks and balances, even to cleaning the bathroom. Are these agencies there yet? No, they're not there yet. But are they on the way? They definitely are. So with the executive order, we also decided we needed to hear from private sector. So we launched an app called reportgov.ng and that gives private sector the opportunity to give feedback or lodge complaints. And then there's a team through my team down to the MDAs. They all have desks that treat those uh, complaints or take those compliments because they've had quite a few compliments. And even on Twitter, they've had unsolicited compliments. And I just like to balance that conversation because when I'm looking at the chat group and I think that there's still just a preconception. So I'd like to challenge all the listeners, almost 200 now, to take the time to find out what has happened that is new. The agencies that you knew in 2015, 2016, drill down and you will see that so much has happened at least they are making effort, tangible effort. Nigeria would not be moving up. Uh, we wouldn't have moved up 39 places in the ease of doing business index, being adjudged by the World Bank if we were not do, taking concrete empirically proven steps. 
and we would not have been listed as the top 10 global reformed economy twice in three years if there wasn't something that some public and civil servants are getting right. So the most important thing that we push on our end is consequence management. And that's both ways, calling out what is not being done properly. So we spend a lot of time, the reform leaders uh, chasing up on the reform champions, the heads of agencies, the ministers through the PEBEC, making sure that what we have agreed is the case. We measure because what gets measured gets done. And on the flip side of it is the PEBEC awards, recognizing publicly what has been done well. A number of reform champions have actually been promoted I know immigration service is almost a fast track to promotion to be a reform champion for EBIS because the amount of work they have to do in engaging with their own colleagues and working on that mindset, like Sister Lera said, will make sure that it becomes a habit. And that's where we want to be till it is self-driven from within the reform culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. That's a very good point. And, you know, we, we get this all the time. So uh, I expected the chat room to be this, uh, you know, active <laughs> in the sense. Uh, but a very interesting point you've raised there about, you know, driving uh, and actively following up, you know, to ensure that, you know, there is delivery. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very good point. But I heard you when you said, you know, uh, incentive, uh, consequence management and incentives. You talked about the public awards and things like that. So I want to bring that question uh, to Mrs. Aida Otobo, and uh, for two reasons. Uh, so the first is that, and I always say this everywhere I go, so I, I don't think I'm going to get tired of it. Uh, fun fact, Mrs. Alera Aida Otobo is the daughter of um, one of the, who those we used to call super palm sex. Uh, I say those we used to call as if I was born then. But anyway, <laughs> Chief Alison Aida, uh, if any of you remembers that name, the Aida panel. Uh, I read it in the textbook, so I never met him. Uh, but she's, she's uh, the daughter of a great Chief Alison Aida of blessed memory. Uh, and I want to take her up on that legacy because so she was basically born into a public sector family, or if you like. Um, you know, what was it like from a legacy point of view? You know, and right now, in terms of the experience, you know, remind us for, for want of words of the good old days. Just let's see if you know we're we're matching up. <laughs> Thank you, Saji. Thank you. I always laugh when you share that fun fact because I think God that was ages ago. And you know, you meet people that never met him, so you get sort of used to it. But what was surprising is that this morning on social media, I saw somebody quoting him and quoting the super pump sex. And the person said, the super pump sex planned this country and we have not had better development plans than they did. All your national infrastructure, roads, highways, pipelines, NLG, the economic zones, et cetera, were products of their work and articulation. I'm not sure it's entirely true, but well. <laughs> reading that on this day, I must say, gladdened my heart and um, made it a bit tender because he's, he's late now. But it also brought many pleasant memories watching him serve Nigeria. And I'd like to sort of highlight some of the things that I learned as I watched him. And the first thing that I'm sort of going to highlight, the memory that really stands out I was young then, but I remember it was during the Civil War. They went to, I think it was Ghana or either East Africa or Ghana. And they went to have one of their many peaceful talks. And we had a wonderful PA called Mr. Banjo, excellent man. And they came back from that journey with Mr. without Mr. Banjo. Why? Because he had been kidnapped and killed. And they wanted to get one of the super pump sex, actually. They wanted to get my father. So that was for me when I knew that his work was not as safe as it looked. That was actually quite dangerous. So one of the things that I saw and learned from him as I watched was how willing he was to, to live a life of sacrifice. He and the other pump sex sacrificed a great deal. I can't go into detail, but I know that they did. He was a proud Nigerian, and that's one thing I know about my father. He had a deep love for the nation, and I'm highlighting the deep love for the nation because we need to know how to are going to infuse that love into our public servants. 
Many public servants are public servants because they have no choice. They're not doing it because they had this eureka moment that I'm going to serve my nation and I'm going to be a public servant and I'm going to go into national planning and national development. And I think we need to sort of bring that back. It may be um, a dream, but it's a dream that can come true. So love for the nation. And then his identity was Nigeria. His identity was not his ethnic group or it was not his tribe. And we were brought up and raised like that. We didn't, I have friends from all over Nigeria, but it was until I joined the civil service, which I'll talk about later, that I shared a room with somebody from, from Southeast Nigeria. And every time somebody came to visit me in the office, when they left, they say, where are they from? I said, where, what do you mean, where are they from? Which part of Nigeria? And I would say, I don't know. And he was always surprised that I didn't know where people came from. It didn't matter. And that's one of the things we need to learn. How are we going to detribalize Nigeria? It's a big question. The third thing that I learned watching him was that they were content. They lived within their pay, but then they were paid. In those days, it's when you couldn't get into public service that you went into private sector. They flipped the script now. I remember when I worked in the public service, I wanted to work in the public service so badly because of my father. And I went there for four, for four years and nine months. And one of the things that I remember when I moved to private sector was because I thought if I never worked in private sector, I would regret it. And I remember when I changed jobs and went into banking, my salary in one year of my civil service was less than the one month in the bank. I couldn't wrap my head around that. Why? Nothing had changed. I didn't have additional skills. I didn't go back to school. I, went, I just crossed over from one sector to another and my salary changed phenomenally. So there's an issue there. Then the thing, that fifth, fourth thing is level five leadership. He had humility, he was competent, um, and that's good to great. For those who haven't read the book, level five leadership, they, that was what they represented. Now, let me fast forward to, I joined the civil service. Um, after that, I, I left, I'll tell the story later. Then I went back after 14 years in private sector, and that was to serve one of the ministers, obvious equity. But after serving her, I joined DFID, like you said earlier, and I ended up serving four ministers. Why am I giving this example? Because each one was so different that I began to wonder what I could, I began to not just wonder, but see the problem that we face in Nigeria. Any, sorry guys, but anybody can be a minister, right? And that troubles me because in other nations, you go through a process to become a minister. You have a track record. You've been trained, you've been prepared. So one of the things that I would like to highlight is what is our level of preparedness? And we've got to start looking at it objectively. Jumoke has excelled because she's been prepared, her training prepared her. And all the other in the panelists were well prepared, their education and their training. So lifelong learning becomes key. Experience because of watching the civil service and watching these four, four ministers. And then the strength of character matters for productivity. Great public service are built by people of conviction, built by people of value and people of character. And those who were, because I thoroughly enjoyed the morning session, Aruna, Mrs. Aruna started her journey in Nigeria and she talked about Wakanda. What did she start with? The values transparency, integrity, accountability, discipline. And then I'm going to close because I know I'm running out of time. The four phases, what I call the four phases of reformation. Our public servants have to be bold and courageous and stand for what they are convinced, uh, what, 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 what the conviction that they have. They have to be missionary. We've got to help them to, to, to see the Nigeria of the future and not try and build the Nigeria of the present. So this, Second phase is that face of the eagle. And the third face is the face of the ox, hard work. And the fourth is wisdom, the face of, face of the man. We've got to have our, 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 our public servants to become strategic thinkers. And all this can come through training. 
So we're going to focus on that later. And I'd just like to end by saying, preparing them more and what I'm going to end with, the reformer's mindset. And it's rooted in three things, love, sacrifice, and service. What I highlighted at the beginning that I saw in my father and what we now need to see in our future public servants that we build the future and the Nigeria of our dreams. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, and uh, it, it was deliberate, you know, to to ask you to speak about that, largely because you know sometimes these things inspire us, you know, to do better. When we hear of the founding fathers, if you like, and you know what they've done, uh, I just thought it was a story that people should uh, people should hear and know that you know if you say Nigeria was great, Nigeria can be greater, you know, and that we can do better, and that's that's the that's the burden of this generation and the future generation. And just talking about the future generation, we're coming very close to the one hour mark now. Uh, so we want to go into uh, the audience questions and we'll be able to take about two or three uh, from the chat room, uh, very good questions. And I'll just ask my co-moderators to please uh, assist with that. But while they're doing that, uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Moro Konla this question. I talked about the future generation uh, particularly. Now, I told you at the beginning that someone described this panel as very young uh, and very influential. Uh, so let me say it this way, uh, Mr. Morocola, as a young man <laughs> yourself, uh, <laughs> um, the public service or the public sector, you know, is perceived by millennials, you know, the youth bulge that we have now, average age of about 18 or 19. They don't see it as, you know, the way forward, that this is not a career for me, you know, the progress is not there. Um, tying it to something that was actually said during the panels this morning, uh, sorry, during the uh, televised edition this morning, that the independence children are about to retire 60 years. So if retirement age is 60 years, so that this is year 60 and anybody born in 1960 that is in the civil service is clocking retirement and should be retiring latest by December. <laughs> the question is, how are we going to fill that gap? You know, what are you doing to attract the millennials? into the civil service. No pressure. <laughs> I want to say first that when I'm attracted to the civil service, Shimoke is attracted to <laughs> we millennials are in public service. But I mean beyond that, I think it's an evolving civil service that you see now. Uh, the civil service that was left behind for us by the Aida generation it has left us with immense and tremendous values. Values that have cultivated a particular way of life, a structured civil service. Yes, there has been degeneration of that culture over time, but that degeneration in itself has evolved because of the type of people that are coming in now. On the contrary, there's a lot of millennials who are aspiring to go into the civil service, the public service, because they see a lot of young, awkwardly mobile individuals in that space. And so what governments need to do today now is the Singapore style model that um, Sister Lero already spoke about, which is to put civil service or public service at par with the private sector in terms of reward and discipline system, in terms of giving people value for what they've trained themselves to do and training them, capacity building. Our HR policies these days now, the civil service reforms that we're embarking on is to encompass digitization. Our education space is to bring in STEM, to have a core focus on STEM so that all of these things that attract millennials to go outside of government are going to be present in government. But it's not a day's journey. It's a process, it's a roadmap. And that roadmap, I believe, is a collective one that we all know we are all buying into. It's not going to be, I wouldn't say it's a rosy picture. Like, I, it's not going to be comparable to working in mobile or total, but it will definitely get to that stage where governments, and governments are already poaching people. You are poached from private sector. Jumoke has come from GTB. Daniel has come from Twara and White. And they all 
came here with her, Sister Alero's profile. She came and she has served in government. She has done a bit and she's moved on. I'm entrenched, entrenched and I lead a public service that I'm extremely proud of. The people that I see that have joined public service in the last 20 years are all people that could have been working in the private sector and they're bringing that change mentality. They're going, their mindset is a growth mindset as opposed to that mindset that is static, that was entrenched in the civil service culture, which is now evolving through technology. And I can, I can almost assure you that if Lagos State government's civil service is anything to go by, millennials are definitely going to flood the system over the short term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was actually, uh, you know, a, a long way to answer the question. <laughs> but I, but, but I, I hear you in the sense that it's a roadmap, right? And that, you know, the, the civil service that we saw in the old is not, and in the past 20 years, we've actually seen, you know, a few people. And, you know, not to, I, I don't know if the moderator can be biased, but, you know, one of my co-moderators is actually a 29-year-old lady in the civil service also, and she's doing fabulously well. So I hear you well, that you're attracting talent. Uh, we just need, you know, probably a few, <laughs> a few more to, to accelerate it. Uh, so we're going to take some questions from... Can I, can I just come in on have that? have a point on that. Okay, doctor, please I go ahead. I have a point on that. I think it's almost a myth to say that millennials are not interested. So maybe because I'm an academic and I have you know, hundreds of students from University of Lagos uh, that I've taught and a good number, so many of them, you know how young the EBS team is. So many of them under 35, so many of them wanting to volunteer, so many of them offering to help, so many of them interested in the work that I do. So younger people are interested in service, in public service. It's now how we entrench them. So many of them volunteer, so many of them follow me on social media, so many of them attend the programs that we do. There are many ways, many, many ways to serve. So even if right now, uh, younger people may be looking for a different career path in terms of remuneration, which is always the issue. And I tell younger people, do you want to serve? I know people that I've had intern that I've taken vacation time, one from Access Bank, uh, a number of them, one from a law firm, another one she was schooling abroad that have interned with Ibis. So even for staying on, I know those that have left private sector, including yourself, to join my team. Yes, <laughs> yes. So let's let's okay. let's not make young people feel like they are not participating. Like they are not interested because they are. We need more of them. Right. I think it is the it is probably the older ones that completely uh, inflected away, and there was this you know big separation. I know the caliber of right. professionals that I deal with in Lagos State Government and at the federal level. So it's not as if everybody you're coming to meet in, in public service is somebody that you know doesn't know anything. And the respect that we need to give our civil and public servants. I need to make that point to the private sector in particular. The respect for the work that they do, it begets, it, it brings out the best of people. I've been in government since 2015. When you respect people, you get the best out of them. And yes, there are bad eggs. There's no denying that. But when people feel that you look at them with the eyes of corruption and inefficiency, then they tend to act that way. They're just hopeless. You don't give them hope. There's no mutual respect. Because we have to reform and work with over 50 agencies, we've had to learn that respecting, demanding. I have very high expectations of Team Nigeria. HMO, we've been uh, on conferences. We've been globally recognized. We've, we've gone to present to the World Bank on behalf of Nigeria. Very competent and capable team of civil servants that have delivered the results for Nigeria. So I thought I should make that point. You are a moderator, so you, 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 can't, you have to- Thank you. <laughs> but, oh, yes. Uh, you know, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Doctor. Very spirited defense, and I, I cannot, I'm, I'm totally convinced, I must, <laughs> I must say. Uh, uh, 
Um, and I want to I want to take questions from the audience uh, because I'm seeing a very uh, strong stream of conversations, of course, around um, you know what should we be doing to. I think one strong question here is says how should we detribalize and basically trying to connect it to the to the discussion around productivity. I think it was Mrs. Alero that mentioned there that it was it didn't matter at that point you know who was who uh, what what state they were from. Uh, so I want to take that I want to take that question, but that's going to be my second question. Now, but my first question I want to address it to to Daniel, Mr. Konobe, and the question really is uh, so just from some research you know that we've seen around, and the doctor has mentioned World Bank research, and they've done a lot you know in terms of public sector performance, and we've identified about five drivers you know that drive public sector performance, and we've mentioned them a lot of touch points, but one that probably we haven't driven the most. And this is not to bring a political undertone to the conversation, uh, but it's interesting that you're from a new state. So I, the question has to come to you for obvious reasons. <laughs> okay. um, technology, incentive mechanisms, institutional capacity building, um, and political leadership have been identified as the drivers of public sector performance. So my question is, you know, from the Edo State perspective, how has political leadership really, you know, pushed you or pushed your team to do better? Do you, does it come to play that heavily, you know, uh, in, 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 in productivity? Thank you, Soji. Um, uh, that is a, an interesting question, but a very useful question. Um, all the other elements you've mentioned fall in like a, like a category. So the three things you need for, in my view and my experience, uh, to drive public sector delivery are one, leadership, two, strong aligned coordination or coordination capacity, and the third, uh, and this we found out when we, when we ran the, the, the labs was communication, having clear, consistent, coherent, you know, communication. Um, for Edo State, I mean, we've been we're very fortunate. We have a very um, strong, I mean, by any standard, um, a first class leader. And one of the things I found very interesting about, about His Excellency is, is that was his ability to compartmentalize. I mean, on one day he's dealing with politics and then he switches and he's back you know, to his desk and he's, he's carrying out his duty. Um, and and it, it was just interesting to watch. Um, even during the heat of the politics, documents never stayed in the stable for more than 48 hours. I mean, he still had time to, to attend to files and everything was working. Um, so having that kind of strong leadership uh, is extremely important. And then building coordination capacity around that. So yes, um, there, there were some distractions, but really it wasn't as as bad as you would have expected. Things still still, still, still went on. Um, those who were the more technical people were focused on driving the governance side and then ensuring that whatever needed to be done, that they let it sign off, were signed off. Uh, and of course, you know that we did not uh, touch the, the, the treasury for politics. So, so funds were largely still, still available to do, to do work. Um, and, and that, and that was, was, was part of um, uh, our experience. Um, so yeah, politics plays a role, but in our own case, we've been fortunate that uh, the leader showed, you know, modeled the way that uh, gave the rest of us um, direction. And, and I, I thought to also mention, I know I, I didn't mention a lot last time I, 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 I said this, um, in, in terms of some good work that has happened, you know, on, on our side, I think the work that has happened with the Edo GIS is something that I, I thought should 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 be be mentioned here. Um, I mean, getting CFO in Edo State used to take about two years, for example. But the governor was very focused on ensuring that you see how do you um, you know collateralize land, and so right now it takes about six weeks to get CFO. It cost about fifteen percent of what it was costing before. Um, no more losing files like it like used to happen and to that level of efficiency and you know that if you don't deliver you see your gas red eye and you don't want to see your gas red eye so so, so that that, that is something i got to, to 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 mention yes okay thank you so so you i mean you've, you've driven the point home and again i i always turn to so when when you start this uh 
states of national competition, uh, Dr. Oduwale immediately becomes they're doing there, you know, between Lagos and Edo State. So I'll just, I'll leave it there, <laughs> which is a good thing, by the way. So uh, it's, it's good to have that competitive spirit at some national level. Uh, but I want to take these two questions from the from the audience. Uh, and after we will, uh, you know, have to come into closing statements. Uh, and I will leave it to the two uh, wonderful ladies on the panel uh, for, for a number of reasons, and it's not to pick on them. The first question is, how do you detribalize Nigeria? Now I'm saying that because, and perhaps, you know, uh, and this question, uh, I'm gonna flip it and actually give it to Dr. Duwani in terms of, um, you know, cause you, you debunked the myth around the millennials. So I want to test this, if this is another myth, how do you detribalize Nigeria? But I want to connect it to even gender balance and the parity even in the workforce, you know, that yes, how do you detribalize Nigeria? But how do you also ensure that women you know, have a greater play in decision making, and in this case, in the public sector. So, how how do we begin to have that conversation, or how do we begin to achieve that? You know, Soji, it's a personal choice, and I was just typing in the chat room. We all have to decide who we are by choice and not tribalistic. So, I've had students from everywhere. None of them will ever tell you, "Oh, she's been." It doesn't. It's not. It doesn't even come up. You are on my team. You are married to someone from Southeast. How, what kind of mishmash do we have on our team? It was only even in the course of social discussions that we even find out stuff about each other. And it was always a beautiful learning experience. One of the things I've enjoyed most about this job is traveling around the country. And every time we go on our, on our, on our professional work, we always take time to you know go to the market, go wherever, just hang out and see the beautiful country even with all the chaos that Nigeria is. So it's a personal choice to love the other, to love what is not like you. And, 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 and I think that part of what follows the choice is uh, the love for justice, just for righteousness and for justice. If I don't want to be treated a particular way, why should I treat somebody else that way? If I don't want to be judged uh, by where I'm from, if I want to be judged by my competence, if I don't want to be segregated because of my gender, then what do I need to do? You need to be competent, you need to be on the mark, and you need to give people more than a fair chance. You need to defer to the other, you need to love. I think, you know, love is really the greatest thing. And Sister Lera was talking about it. How do we love our country? How do we love Nigeria? The other day, I was talking about how, since I got this job, I train myself to love green, just to love Nigeria. And how do we love Nigerians? Because it's one thing to keep saying you love Nigeria. If you don't love Nigerians from everywhere, Nigerians that are not like me, Nigerians that didn't live in Lagos, didn't go to a school, don't talk like me, don't, don't act like me. I've made so many friends in Abuja, just from different places where just people that are, you would never have met any other way and you respect them, you enjoy their company, it's a personal choice. We each have to decide that we're going to be that change that we want to see. We can't wait for anybody else. Nobody else is gonna build this country and we are one country. So we're together and we just have to love each other and deal with each other, work with each other, not manage each other. You know, people are always like, oh, we're stuck together, we should just break up. All that is divisive and it means nothing. It's, it's, it's narrow-minded because it's not visionary. This is a beautiful country. The other day I gave a speech, I was talking about the Bini Kingdom. The Bini Kingdom goes back to 1180 AD. I was talking about how the Oba was addressing all Daniel's bosses and the reverence with which they listened to him. I watched it on TV and I was so proud. I went to do research on the Bini Kingdom. And I was so proud. I have goosebumps even now. That is the dynasty to which we belong because it's part of Nigeria. I have no Edo blood in me, but that is part of my story anywhere in the world. There are Festac masks in Stockholm, in New York, in London. You think I'm going to be in that museum and somebody's going to say, I'll say, oh, it's from Edo. It's from Nigeria. Nigeria. And that's who I am. Indeed. That's who I am. So it's personal. It's personal. Thank you very much, Doctor. I, I, and I, you know, I like I like the way you put it. It's a personal choice. 
And so in uh, and, uh, the <laughs> the Edo man is giving you a round of applause, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, but so I want to take the next question, and uh, and then we will come to. I'm afraid we have to come to some closing statements as we're committed to uh, just about an hour of you know of your time, uh, Mrs. Alera Idaotobo, and I'm going to also ask the head of service to answer this question uh, for, and he will know why um, shortly. Now, the question here is how much have we deployed modern productivity tools and teamwork skills in the public service? That's the question. But I want to tie it to one of the drivers of uh, that, you know, that have been reset as the drivers of public sector performance, which is institutional capacity building. And my question to you, you know, as a transformation strategist and educationist, if you want to do, what exactly should the public sector curriculum, let's use that word, you know, the civil service curriculum and things like that, what should it be focusing on in this day and age where we now have what we call a new normal, you know, uh, COVID has shown us, you know, <laughs> things that were unimaginable. Uh, and so what should, you know, uh, institutional capacity building be focusing on right now, you know, in the public sector? Uh, Mrs. Otobo, you go first, and then uh, Mr. Morokola. Thank you, Swaji. Um, before I answer that, I just want to go back a little to what Jumoke said. And you can do that in, in 30 seconds and then because yeah. we have to close shortly. About, <laughs> I'm trying it in because it's going to do with curriculum. I okay. love what you said about um, that is choice. But I think we have to come to the point because I'm, an, uh, I'm, I'm sort of an educationist. We have to teach that choice. We have to teach Nigerians to be detribalized. We have to teach them to honor one another. So I just want to put that there that we, have, we can teach it, other nations have taught it, and we can. And one of the first way is forget federal character, can it be state of, state of residence, not state of origin, that's one. Now, coming to institutional um, capacity building, it is key. Um, I, I, and, and I think Lagos State, you guys, you know, the state is, is actually quite way ahead of a lot of other states. You are trailblazers. And you are, uh, uh, and 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 you're creating new pathways much more than you realize till you go to other states, uh, and and I think that's important to take note of as well. So institutional building, I, I have eight things that I think if we're going to look at it, that a certain type of civil servant we have them, we have them in pockets, we have them as oasis of excellence. But can we have a civil service that would just be like the one in Singapore that there are no exceptions? The norm is the excellence, not the other way around. And how do we build that? I think if you look at, at how, how would we would be that, if you looked at creating this new kind of civil servant by looking at four different pockets, and I call them four categories. The first is, is character, the values. I think we can build modules around but that will transform people's thinking in terms of their mindset, in terms of their values. The second is knowledge. And this is where I'm going to tie the importance of knowledge is, is the economy, policy formulation, um, 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 politics, and just understanding how government works and how the economy works. The third is the, is the skills, ensuring that all our all our civil servants have a certain level of skills. Everybody should have. In other words, you tick the box. I'm digital, digital I'm a, I can use technology, I can, I can do what I need to do using that technology. And the fourth is the attitude. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done at that level. Now, when we pay attention to that, one of the things that I think is missing as well, and we need to put it, we need to build it into our institution is nation building. Can we have civil servants who are thinking nation building, not the exception, but the norm. So you enter in and you get a nation building mindset and you understand how to transform nations. You're a transformational leader. You can be taught to be that. You can be a, a, a systems transformation person. You can be taught how to transform systems. Um, you can you understand community renewal and transformation. Why are all these important? because there are two contending realities that we all face now. The first reality 
is the level of poverty in our nation. It's bad, and we all know it. We've been named the poverty capital of the world. It's bad. I was involved with, during lockdown, feeding the poor people in several slums. It is bad. Then the other reality is the innovation and technology. How do we marry those two realities as excellent public servants? Not the exception, but for everyone. And that's what the curriculum, that's the institutional building. And then helping, helping civil servants to build the bridges that they need to connect us to the future so that they become what I would call imaginal leaders. Imaginal leaders don't have to see the future and they pull that future into now. How does every single public servant become an imaginal leader? It can be taught. And so that's where I think I'll stop. And I will, I, can I tell one more story? Just one more story, Sergio. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I have to defy you. <laughs> I have to take it, sorry. I have okay. to take it on to Mr. Murray Okola okay. now where I yeah, hope very, I, so long as the points are there, that's fine. No, but, no, but you, you made the point and very eloquently, actually. Uh, but um, uh, one of the measures of productivity is also keeping to time. So I'm interested in you know closing this uh, just as we uh, just as we started. So it's uh, three, it's four fifteen. That's about an hour gone. Uh, I'm sure we can excuse a few more minutes and then we can close. So Mr. Okola, I, I like what Mrs. Aida Otobo has said, and perhaps she has just done a very good job for you that Lagos State is ahead of the pack. So please tell us, what are you doing in terms of institutional capacity building? What is, you know, what is Lagos State focusing on in terms of its civil service that is making it ahead of the pack? Thank you very much. Uh, I think a lot of the things that uh, Stalera has said pretty much covers so many of the grounds, but without trying to reiterate much, you know, a motivated public service, a motivated public workforce will deliver an output that is desirable to all. Um, I think that in Lagos State, we strive for excellence. Excellence is non-negotiable. And so every public servant must strive for excellence. But the problem I see is that everything stops and starts with leadership. And the quality of leadership is what drives the pack. Um, sadly, because of the foray of politics into governance, uh, I would allude to Alero, Ms. Alero's statement that anybody can be a minister as long as your constituency just chooses you and you will be driving and leading um, seasoned public servants who are seasoned civil servants who are quite efficient at what they do. And so you see that distortion in terms of output without any prejudice to the caliber of public servants that are for it into civil service in our midst. I think they're doing an excellent job. But I also think that our civil service in itself, apart from effective service recruitment, staff recruitment, staff deployment, and training sessions that they undergo, we are moving into a situation where every public servant in Lagos State now has access to a learning management system online. So irrespective of whether the algorithm is choosing you or is not choosing you, there are platforms that we have entrenched in the service that you can always tap into, which cover a large curriculum that covers every subject of governance, health, economics. And all of these things are being brought to bear and open and affordable, not at no cost to any public servant, but it all starts from the leadership. The, the civil service that we lead in Lagos State is undergoing various administrative reforms administrative structures, barriers are being broken. And every, everybody, we're rewarding high flyers. There's the long service award, merit award, state order of merit, recognition of public servants who are excelling. And all of these things drive the workforce into delivering the goods. And like Jimoke said, respecting public servants is very, very critical. From the last mile officer on the road to the to the, to the permanent secretary in the office, they need and deserve respect before they can also give back reciprocal services to the populace. Very interesting point. I, I thank you very much, uh, Head of Service, for you know for putting it in in, in very good perspective. Uh, so clearly, I mean, we're pulling all the levers in terms of the drivers of performance, and uh, and that's that's working for Lagos. 
Uh, we have to come to closing statements uh, because we've taken a few questions from, and I'm sure that even from your discussions, I noticed that you were reading the chat. So it, you've touched on even uh, some of the questions that are asked or some of the, uh, some of the comments. Well, we've called it a call to action. Uh, so very quickly, we're going to do two things as we, the first is just snap poll in the room, uh, just to and also vote on this. It's a very simple uh, survey of two questions, just to gauge, you know, for our own um, understanding, you know, the level of um, productivity, even in this workshop as we are right now. Um, so honest answers, don't worry, it's anonymous. Uh, so the head of service is not going to be penalizing you for judging yourself <laughs> least productive or, or highest productive in the sense. But we would like to gauge in the room, you know, who are the public sector workers and what do you think about your productivity level? And we'll, you know, just almost like a, you know, a reflection, uh, you know, where you, an out of body experience and you look at yourself and you honestly appraise yourself just for the benefit of the conversation that we've had here so far. Um, so we'll take some votes. I think we're, so we're about, a, about 200 on the group right now um, and we're seeing voting. So we'll just take this for about a minute and a half and then we'll come to closing statements. This is just to, uh, you know, gauge uh, the mood of the room. Um, I'm interested in, in the head of service votes, but it's an anonymous poll, so I don't know what he has chosen. <laughs> I don't know what he has chosen. I'm also interested in the, in the cycle of it. You voted already. <laughs> All right, well, we, so an, as an aside, we learned this from Edo State. So you vote and you post it on the server immediately on the internet so that there's no... <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a separate joke for another day. Okay, I think we're we are about a 50% mark in terms of voting uh, and we are gonna close this shortly. So just to get a sense of what's going on. Um, okay. Okay, it looks like we're getting towards the end. Uh, okay, voting closing shortly. Okay, and then we'll just end it here. Uh, so we're ending that poll and um, I'll just share the results out there so you can see it. So on this group, I think we have about 60, 40 in terms of public sector people uh, in this workshop and about another 33% of them, so 70, 30 if you like, um, who are not in the public sector. And you know, there's uh, just about 50% have rated themselves um, highly productive, that's of the 50% that voted, you know, and um, we have that number also on, you know, score four. Uh, nobody here, so we, it seems we have the best of the pack here. Now that you have voted that way, uh, then I can now bring you what we're going to do, because you basically set yourselves up by saying that you are highly productive <laughs> or that you're, uh, so we're going to take closing statements. Uh, like I said, the topic is improving public sector productivity, a call to action. So what it really means is that you can never be you know, productive enough. You can keep going. There's always a higher level to go to. And I want to take a call to action around the room. And I'm going to start with Mr. Ikonobe. Um, and to say that you know, we've, we've had this conversation now. And you know, interestingly, you are going into a new term of administration. What, what can you commit to in terms of specific actions within your team that you believe, you know, that by doing one, two, three, four things, you know, you should see, you know, a greater level of productivity for public service delivery? Um, well, one is to try to clarify the vision and to create a pool vision that is um, compelling that people can aspire to and where they see themselves aligned to that vision and, and understand it enough and communicate it as often as we can. That is one. Two is to um, demand for excellence and put pressure, very positive pressure to achieve what we are trying to achieve. And the third is to take, you know, um, to encourage um, our people to take personal responsibility for excellence. I mean, one of the things that I, I experienced, and I think I've shared this with, with you personally before, 
where by the time I was dealing with junior level government officials, I kept on hearing them say things like the government should, the government should, the government should. And then mid-level government officials were also saying government should, government should, government should. Uh, senior level government officials, they too were saying the government needs to do this, the government needs to do that. And I'm sure John Mokia will bear witness to this. You know, when I got in the villa, I also hear people saying if only the government will do this and the government will do that. And I, <laughs> and I wondered, you know, so where is this government? And um, it's to promote the idea of, you know, hashtag I am government, you know, whatever is not happening, whatever I'm not doing is not happening. Um, whatever policy I don't write, is not it's, it's not it's not going forward um and to also encourage you know colleagues that our principles are really to a large extent pens in the hands of the of, of the subordinates because we do all the documentation um even if they, they spot anything or change anything it's maybe one or two things so whatever rigor or work we don't put in we don't get so whatever civil service public service or nigeria that we see is the one that we created no matter how junior mid-level we are so um for us to take responsibility for the outcome of, of our country yeah thank you very much those were two very clear points um taking responsibility demanding excellence clarifying the vision uh, to your team and also encouraging people to take personal responsibility uh, and i like that hashtag i am government uh, perhaps i will have a brand campaign around that you know someday <laughs> anyway okay so i'll come to you mrs uh, otogo uh, again insider outsider uh, but let me put you in a room right now. If you were in a room with these three fine um, experts, government leaders, uh, and you were to tell them, you know, what three things should they be focusing on with their teams in order to drive productivity? Uh, so I'm putting you in the, giving you a consultant hat now, and I'm saying, speak to the head of service, speak to the special advisor to the president, uh, speak to the special advisor to the governor. Uh, what three things, you know, action points, should they be taking back to their teams and implementing, you know, to drive productivity? No pressure. My mic is, my mic is not. Yes, yeah, she's, I think she's gonna come up on mute. Yes, thank yes. you. The first thing I'll say is one of the drivers of, of productivity is personal transformation. And that as leaders, they should pay close attention to the transformation journey of their team members and be able to do a mapping exercise of what they feel they need that each person should have in terms of those four quadrants, knowledge, skills, values, and attitude. And do a mapping of each person and just see where they are and then help them to go on the journey of personal transformation to make, make, make them the best version of themselves. And I think that that will immediately elevate the, the, the level. And some of them have great teams already, but as we know, there's always more. We can always do better. Everybody can always do better. The second thing I'll, uh, I'd like to say is that in the, in the world where information is, is required and at such speed, that one of the things I wanted to um, put out is to be, to be wonderful to have like an online and they may have it already. So if you do, excellent. But if you don't, an online, like an online resource database where the teams have access to information right at their fingertip. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't have to, um, they don't have to go too far, but almost like having a, a, a research unit. And I, I, ha I suspect because um, Dr. Jumakek has come from academia that she probably has that. But if more um, public servant leaders could actually have that access to resource database that each team member can access. So it doesn't depend on how good I, how good I am at research. I, uh, everybody can be really good at it, get information that will drive the quality of their memo taking and the quality of their report writing and the quality of their policies. So that's one of the things that I will say. And then the third, because I thought about this before, so can I, I would like to put it out Please. there that it would be yeah. great to have like a nation building school. I, I, I really think that, I, I really think that um, the beauty of some leading nations like Singapore was that from the beginning, their public servants were nation builders. And we can tell stories about that. 
uh, and, and, and the Germans as well, the, the, the nation builders. So to be, it should be good for the millennial. And there's a, there's a move that is happening now and it's a nation building move. What can we do to craft right from uh, even the curriculum, Nigerian curriculum, a patriotic mindset, a love for the nation, we can infuse into our curriculum. These are steps we, we can take. And that's where, and, 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 and I'll end with, focus on what I call three Ps, the, the, the posture of your, of, your, of your team members, their perspectives and their paradigms. Again, that personal transformation journey will take them down the right road. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Otobo. So Dr. Dr. Duwale, you, and, and this happens a lot, but I'm, and I'm sure you can allude to this from private sector. So when a consultant tells you something, you tend to hear something differently. <laughs> something entirely different from what the consultant said and you're interpreting it in your way. So I'm almost sure that, you know, uh, whatever Mrs. Otobo has said, you have uh, an improved, the word is not improved, but, you know, a, 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 a digested version of it in your own words. So I want to take you up on a quote. I mean, this is one of the advantages of having your former colleague or <laughs> on the call with you. Uh, so a very popular quote, anybody that knows Dr. J, she will tell you whatever doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So, <laughs> so I'm going to take you right on that. Uh, and I'm almost sure the last time I checked, Mr. President's mandate hasn't changed. It's about top 100 in ease of doing business. Um, so how, you know, what, what specific actions are you going to be taking over the next six to 12 months to boost the productivity on your team, you know, that can get us, you know, to... <laughs> Uh, to this promised land, if you like. <laughs> you know, I work with Team Nigeria, so I work with uh, public and civil servants from Lagos, right. the channel, uh, federal government agencies, and we present as such a very united and, and harmonious team. Believe it or not, we're going into our sixth national plan, Q1 of 2021. We work with empiricals and we work with strategy. So it starts every year at the beginning of November, the PEBEC approves the plan and we start the iteration of discussing what we're going to achieve in that year. By January, we firmed up and we've agreed the steps, a lot of negotiation back and forth, you know the drill. And by end of February, beginning of March, end of February, we start the national action plan, 60 days. And it's like, boom, 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 boom. Really what gets measured gets done. Firm tracking, they know the drill. The consequence management, the traffic lights, are you green? Huh? Are you red? You're before the PEBEC, or I'm writing to your governor, you know, whatever. I'm telling HMO that, look, you know, the, the reform champions are not seen, I'm not seeing the movement. And that is what it takes, escalation. And when you have the leadership that pays attention, when you have the leadership that pays attention, it happens. With Edo State, because I could talk forever about Lagos, the small claims court, they got it done. My former uh, lecturer, Professor Morogwe, who's the attorney general, spoke with the, with the chief judge and they got it done. The governor was there, the uh, deputy governor was there, Daniel was there, they got it done. That's harmony, the, the speaker of the house was there, flush. And so you know that the small claims court was delivered for Edo State people with Lagos, I mean, HMO himself has come to lead the delegation for Lagos State. We were in DC together to speak to the World Bank team. So they knew that this wasn't a, a low level commitment. When you have that commitment, the public servants themselves, the civil servants themselves, all the MDAs, they know that top bottom, it's serious. So it goes to NEC, it goes to FEC, it goes to PEVEC, and then the consequence management, I can't, I can't mention it enough. And with that, my closing shot would be, we need the support of the private sector. Report.gov.ng. Make those complaints make those reports, put your name on it, tell us when it happened, tell us where it happened, tell us who it was, whether it was a bribe, whether it was inefficiency, whether you didn't get your permit, your license, whether the process was sloppy. We need that data because what gets measured gets done. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Doctor. And, and I had you on that, you know, action planning, action implementation, consequence management, and then you turn it over to private sector, test it, report it, and let's know because we need the data. Um, so I, everybody has been calling him HMO. So I, I think I have to join at this point. <laughs> I'd say uh, HMO. So we are here now. 
I'm seated in Lagos, Nigeria. So um, I want to know, you know, what you are going to be doing over the next six to 12 months to boost, you know, the productivity in the civil service. And I'm saying this for a particular reason. I researched, uh, you know, I was reading some of your speeches and I saw one where you were given the, it's called the Lagos Order of Productivity Award, if I'm correct, in 2019. And you were giving it to the, I think it's the Lagos Resilience Agency. And you made a very important quotation. I'm just going to paraphrase it, you know, just so uh, you don't think I was stalking you. <laughs> so I'm just going to paraphrase it very quickly. And you said the, 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 the pace of national re-engineering that we want is directly proportional, you know, to, for want of words, our productivity, the pace of our productivity. So I'm asking you now, if you want to accelerate that national re-engineering or, you know, let's even say this, the state re-engineering, you know, what, what action points are you taking, you know, in the next six to 12 months to accelerate the productivity level in the Lagos State Civil Service? Thank you very much, Sanjay. Uh, first of all, I'll start with saying that, just like Jimoke said, if you measure it, then you can track it. If you don't measure it, you can't track it. So we as a government know what we want to do over the next 12 months. But first of all, our state re-engineering is meeting people's expectations. And people meeting people's expectations requires feedback. Uh, just like the report board, we also have our citizens gate portal, which is a feedback mechanism between us and the people of Lagos. We expect a feedback, feedback to tell us where we're getting it wrong where we're getting it right and what we can do to constantly improve. Within ourselves as well, we are constantly tracking and uh, appraising ourselves. There's a period of appraisals. We just finished my one year appraisal about a week and a half ago, where every sector, all the Cup of Champions came together to measure what we've done, where we lacked, and where we need to shore up. I mean, budgetary constraints, um, we factored in though, because there's been dwindling revenues, but still productivity has um, kind of become enhanced because there's a new normal now. We're all sitting down here now without having to be physically present in one venue. And we're actually doing stuff that propels growth, propels development. And that is where we're going to now. There's a new normal that we've all adapted ourselves to driven so far by technology uh, with a major focus being health technology being the pivotal part of our lives at this current period. And I think that if we continue to track ourselves, we will continue to meet our goals, targets and objectives. But more importantly is the feedback and community engagement where we need to measure ourselves based on what people expect from us and what we also said we would do. Thank you. Excellent point, excellent point. Thank you very much, uh, um, Head of Service. And I, I, I think what I took from you was, you know, states re-engineering is about meeting the expectations of people. You know, it's you know, directly talking about public service delivery. And, you know, that perhaps is the concluding statement for today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very, very exciting panel. I've thoroughly enjoyed, you know, the discussion uh, because it tells you that the public sector you know affects you know every aspect of your life so you know we've gone into some we've touched a little bit on politics but we've talked about personal development having a personal choice for productivity we've talked about having love you know and compassion for your nation that's you know patriotism you know we've talked about you know debunking the millennial the myth of the millennials in the workforce and showing that actually they are there and, you know we've talked about what we should be focusing on in terms of uh, you know institutional capacity building um, I like the point that Mrs. Alera Itobo mentioned about, um, you know, having a nation building school. Well, perhaps some state or some, uh, you, know, uh, you know, public institution will take that up. But of course, already in curriculum, we see a lot of that, uh, even with the return of civic, uh, civic studies, uh, if I'm correct, you know, to, uh, to the education curriculum. But uh, we can talk about that another day. What I like most is the action point that we have now thrown back at the private sector where we have said, look, you have to take responsibility. You have to report, you have to test us. You have to, if you are gonna demand excellence from us, 
then you have to be ready, you know, to, uh, you know, publicly uh, tell us when we're not doing the right thing so that we can go back into the room, you know, and adjust it. There's this uh, popular thing, uh, I'm sure Daniel, uh, and uh, I don't know how, when last uh, Dr. Duole entered a book app, but it, <laughs> there's a popular saying, <laughs> but Daniel and I, we know where we meet in the book app. <laughs> And there's a popular saying that if we do bad, tell us, you know, if we do good, tell everybody. So really, <laughs> that's what it's about in the public sector. You know that, look, if we are not doing it right, report it so that we can iterate the process, you know, and get it better. But if we're doing good, then you should please blow the trumpet because the public service is the public service of Nigeria, the public sector of Nigeria, and it's for all of us. I want to thank you uh, a lot, um, Mr. Dr. Oduwale, uh, Mr. Hakim Oruekwala, Mr. Daniel Okonobe, Mrs. Alera Aida Otobo, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for making this a very interesting and a very rich discourse. I want to thank the audience for your patience and following through and also for the very rich comments uh, that you've put in the chat boxes. Uh, we should have been uh, you know, making some of these comments also on social media, so it's not too late to go on social media and you know, type your experience at this workshop with the hashtag uh, platform NG60. So that's platform NG60. Uh, you can also search for any of my panelists on Twitter. Uh, they all have their Twitter handles tied to their names. So if you just type Jumoke Oduwale, uh, it should come up as uh, with a Twitter handle. And you can, you know, tweet at them and share your experience around this workshop. Uh, this workshop, you know, is just the beginning of a conversation. Now, we, we are to go back as workshops are to, are to implement the things that we have heard here and to build on these actions in order to improve our own personal productivity. And it is those little drops of water that make the mighty ocean and that make Nigeria, uh, the Nigeria that we, that we want for ourselves and for our children. And on that note, I would like to say a very good evening, uh, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are, uh, <laughs> uh, as we bring this session to a close. One final point is that I would like to thank my co-moderators, and if I can just call them into the room very quickly, co-moderators uh, to say, uh, just to show you, and just to also support Dr. Duoli's debunking of the myth <laughs> uh, that I have some millennials here <laughs> and they have been the ones uh, making sure that it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it's a good experience. Uh, so I'd like to thank Busayo and John Babalola and a co-moderator in Abuja, uh, Ayokuno Ojeni, uh, who also uh, assisted in facilitating uh, facilitating this. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you. Have a good evening and happy Independence Day, Nigeria. Thank you. 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 Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wrap. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be unto your holy name. Thank you for the opportunity, my Father and my God. All glory be unto you, in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, I'd like us to save the chat. So we save the chats.